a Faith in a Base podcast, 054, The Great Commission, Make Disciples. Well, welcome to the second lesson of our five-part series about the Great Commission. In our first lesson, we talked about Jesus' command to go. We learned that this first command, go, was loaded with potential and can take us way out of our comfort zone. The second command of the Great Commission is to make disciples, and it should probably come as no surprise that this seemingly small command is absolutely loaded with potential as well. In fact, by the end of this lesson, we will discover some pretty serious conclusions about what biblically defines a Christian. Now, the second command of the Great Commission probably demands the most elbow grease of the four crisp commands Jesus gave us. So, buckle that seatbelt and let's get started. In our study of the Great Commission, we break each command down and present it as a complete and independent sentence. So, here's the second command written in this form. Make disciples of all nations. Short sentence, right? This sentence contains a subject, a verb, a direct object, and a little prepositional phrase. The verb of this sentence is make, and we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about this activity. The direct object is the what to make. In this case, we'll be making disciples. That prepositional phrase is of all nations. Now, when we look at this sentence, you might think we're missing a subject noun. You got to have a noun and a verb to make a complete sentence, right? Even a shortened version of this sentence, make disciples, is technically a complete sentence. So where's the noun? What's the subject of the sentence? Well, think back to seventh grade English. I remember this one. This is a fun lesson. The subject of the sentence is the implied you. So if we're going to say the complete and full sentence, it would be you make disciples of all nations. The purpose of this sentence is an imperative. It's a command. Not only is it pointed and personal, it is required. Making disciples is not optional. This, by the way, is the plural you. Jesus is talking to the remaining 11 disciples, the the apostles. It's to them exclusively he is saying you make. We have no indication there's anyone else present and pretty clear evidence that it's just the 11 he was speaking. Jesus' commands are given to a very select group of men, the men he's been training for the last three years, the men who have walked closely with him every single day. So let's modify this slightly and make sure we understand this is a plural form of the verb you. If we're down south, we're talking to the full group and we'd say, y'all make disciples. Jesus tells the apostles, and by extension us, to make something. Making something implies effort. It requires an activity. There's work required. Noah Webster, in his 1828 dictionary, offers over 60 definitions for the word make. Here's just a few. To compel, to constrain, to create, to cause to exist, to form from nothing, to bring into a state or condition, to constitute. The word make means the act of creating something new which did not previously exist. It also implies deliberate effort is directed toward that goal. The person performing the effort would obviously have a goal in mind, and we should understand they probably have some sort of motivation for which they're producing the effort. More on that in just a moment. So this little word make is pretty packed. When we couple this second command from the Great Commission with the first command to go, it becomes even more challenging. Why? Well, remember, we're still talking about evangelism. A disciple is a maker. A disciple of Jesus does not sit in some lofty cathedral or busy themselves with the mundane activities of the church as a substitute for evangelism. A disciple of Jesus is laser focused on seeking and saving the lost. It's the number one priority of their life every day. And exactly what does a disciple of Jesus produce? There's nothing confusing here. There's nothing ambiguous. Jesus' commands are clear and straightforward. We are to make disciples. Unfortunately, making disciples is an exercise very few people are involved with today. For the average person who calls themselves a Christian, they are content to go to church on Sunday, pay their respects to God for an hour or so, and then live any way they want for the rest of the week. They relegate the task of making to a pastor, an evangelist, or the church marketing department. The deliberate activity of evangelizing the world is not something they really want to be involved in, and even if they do occasionally bring a friend to church, they would still hand off the conversion process to a new member's team or some other church leader. This is not how a disciple of Christ operates. 
A disciple of Christ takes the command to make as personal, not corporate. Remember that implied you make disciples is your privilege. Now let's talk about that little prepositional phrase tacked on at the end, which tells us where to go and make to all nations. This defines the target audience for our efforts. In essence, there's no limit to the process. Even as new nations are formed, those need to hear the gospel message as well. And by the way, if we're going to all nations, that kind of destroys the idea of racism and prejudice in the church, doesn't it? Very cool. So a disciple of Christ is deeply motivated and deeply devoted to the activity for which the master has redeemed him. He's about the master's business of making disciples. A disciple of Jesus must have the desire and ability to reach and teach, at least at some basic level. Think about it. If God did not intend for you to further his kingdom here on earth, why would he leave you here after you became a Christian? Because Jesus tells us to make disciples in the proclamation of the Great Commission, we understand without confusion the purpose of a disciple is to make other disciples. This is why we say there's no other kind of disciple than one who makes disciples. If a person is not about the business of making other disciples, should they call themselves a disciple? Let that one sink in. Disciples make disciples. But what's a disciple? Well, let's turn to the dictionary once again. Disciple is a noun. It comes from Latin. It means to learn. A learner, a scholar, one who receives or professes to receive instruction from another, as in the disciples of Plato. Disciple means a student, a follower, an adherent to the doctrines of another. Hence, the constant attendants of Christ were called his disciples. And hence, all Christians are called his disciples as they profess to learn and receive his doctrines and precepts. So, a disciple is a student or a learner. But this word carries a much deeper meaning than a person who just sits in a classroom, doesn't it? A disciple is a close associate of the teacher. We might say they walk with the teacher. They spend time with the teacher. They become very familiar with the teacher's ways. When someone is that connected to a mentor, they even become like the teacher. They don't just learn bits of information or clever ideas. They begin to imitate their teacher. In our modern world, I think the word apprentice comes pretty close to how we might understand the word disciple, but even that still lacks a certain depth of closeness in the relationship. Let me give you an example. In college, I had many professors and I sat in many classes, but I was a disciple of my photography teacher, Carl Scott. This was a relationship that changed my life. He took the students out of the classroom and into nature. He spent time hanging out with us. He had us over for cookouts and dinners. He introduced us to the beautiful works of art he and others had produced. In many ways, we were profoundly changed by his keen efforts to immerse us in the art of photography. We didn't just learn the mechanics of photography, we learned the heart of the art. Still today, I find myself thinking about things the way I thought about them back then. I find myself using phrases we used in our common group speak. And I even find myself using mannerisms that my teacher possessed. You know, we all think we are such rugged individuals. We all think we've arrived at the spot that we're in by our clever abilities and astute thinking. But the truth is, we're all just composites of the people that we've met and who've influenced our lives. You see, you're not the independent individual you think you are. You're a mixture of influences. When you become a disciple of Jesus, you begin a relationship with the greatest influencer of all time and become in many ways just like him. A disciple is under the influence of their master. They act like the master. They have the same heart, mind, spirit of the master. A disciple of Christ becomes like Jesus and is willing to change anything in their character which is not like Christ. Becoming more and more like Christ every day is our goal. This was keenly evident in the first century. Take a look at this scripture in Acts 11, 25 through 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Folks, this is a historical record. This is the first time in history the word Christian is ever used. And this word Christian was used as a derogatory epithet. It meant little Christ or Christ imitator. 
that's not offered as a compliment. Now, what makes this really cool is that this testimony comes from strong critics of the church as to what they saw in the character of these followers of Christ. They saw individuals who acted like Christ. Now, it may fascinate you to know that this word Christian is used only three times in the entire Bible. But the word disciple and its derivatives is used over 300 times. Why is this important? Well, now think about this. What group of people had this label Christian slapped on them? Was it the members of the Lions Club? No. Was it the Baptists? The Catholics? No. The only people who were called Christians were disciples. So why would we call someone a Christian today if they're not making disciples? A disciple makes disciples, right? While it's true there are millions of people deeply devoted and dedicated to their favorite brand of Christianity, I think we need to be painfully honest and understand there is a difference. I believe this difference defines the narrow gate that Jesus told us about. And think about how this plays out through the rest of the New Testament. Knowing that the only people who called themselves Christians were the disciple makers means that whenever you see the word disciple in the Bible, we're talking about a Christian. So, if we turn this into a little math formula, we might say disciple equals Christian equals saved. There's no other conclusion we can draw from Acts 11.26. You know, even among unbelievers who know very little about Christianity, the word disciple carries with it a seriousness and a dedication not found in the word student. Some people even confuse the word disciple with the word apostle because they associate that word with that kind of dedication found in Jesus' closest relationships. The point is that the word disciple carries with it a seriousness and a form of dedication which goes way beyond the casual day-to-day -day idea of a student. Now check this out. Jesus did not tell the apostles to go make believers. He didn't tell them to go make religious people. He did not even tell them to go make Baptists, Lutherans, Catholics, or even Christians. Jesus told the apostles to go make disciples. Now, making disciples does not mean getting someone to make an emotional decision or, or a commitment to follow Jesus by raising their hand in a church service or saying a prayer to be saved. Truly making disciples requires a little more effort. First of all, it's a one-on-one -on -one activity. Preaching in the church can reach the masses as it did on the day of Pentecost, and people can respond correctly to the gospel message. But for the most part, when we are preaching in churches today, we're just preaching to those who have already accepted the message. We need to seek and save the lost outside the church. But preaching in public where the lost people are is pretty ineffective this day and age. Public preaching in the early church was effective because the message was new. Today, it's largely ineffective because so many people are already convinced that their flavor of Jesus is the right one and they're not about to budge spiritually. Even if someone does respond to public preaching, they will still need someone to make sure they understand what their commitment to Christ really involves. So why would I say this is a one-on-one -on -one experience? Listen, this is super important. When we find someone who is curious about Christ, we teach them the gospel, which includes their repentance before they make that commitment to Christ. This means we should probably have at least a little bit of a warm relationship with them. Try telling someone that you're not really close to that they need to give up that job at the adult video store or break off that immoral relationship before they can become a disciple of Jesus and see where that gets you. Now, we know clearly from the scriptures, repentance always comes before conversion. Someone's got to help them understand what sin is. Someone needs to love them enough to tell them the truth. And don't be remiss. Making a disciple means that sin is confronted, not ignored. This is done with gentleness and respect, but in discipling fellowships, sin is addressed well before someone makes their decision to become a Christian. In this modern church era, far too many people accept the easy believism offered from the pulpit, then find they must deal with an unconverted soul because nobody helped them confess and renounce their specific sins before they were converted. Simply saying a prayer is not how someone becomes a Christian. Because there's no real repentance, there's no real conversion, and the person is left in an unsaved state 
without the Holy Spirit to help them along. They quickly give up and leave what they thought was Christianity, where they expect to find the promise of an awesome new life. When we're teaching someone about Christ, we must help them understand their sin and, and how to turn away from it. The Bible tells us that people must repent before their obedience to the gospel, and you're their best friend helping them into eternity. So it's not an easy task to make a disciple, but it's also not an easy task to be made a disciple. It takes great humility. Let me explain why. In our modern church era, there's a ton of bad doctrine. Making disciples also means tearing down bad traditional teachings about the Christian religion. New disciples come to understand that the Bible is their prime source of knowledge and training, not man-made traditions or very real religious experiences. In making a disciple, we help a person understand what life was like for the first century disciples and explain how they can be great role models and we desire to be like them as they became like Christ. This cleaning up of old traditions and bad doctrine can be a source of some real conflict. Old religious traditions often die violent deaths, but when a person truly makes Jesus Lord and is committed to studying the scriptures for themselves and allowing those scriptures to be the final authority, bad doctrine and traditions quickly fall away as the truth blossoms fully. This all takes great patience and careful instruction. It takes time together and communication. It takes walking together, talking together, and eating together, and always praying and opening the Bible together. Let's face it, people can claim and do claim great nonsense about the Bible, and people will gullibly believe it, especially if we're unwilling to check out religious claims for ourselves. Look at this, Acts 17.11. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. When Paul, the great apostle, was out making disciples, he met the fine folks who lived in Berea, and they welcomed the message gladly. The Bible says they possessed great eagerness. That's awesome. But you know what? That wasn't enough for them. They did not just take Paul at his word. They grabbed their scriptures and examined them every day to see if what Paul said was true. Can you imagine that? The great apostle Paul being fact-checked by the Bereans? This introduces us to another important character quality of a disciple. They read and study their Bible pretty much every day. In the churches I know which practice this form of discipleship, this particular character quality really stands out. Even outsiders who often claim, wow, those guys really know their Bible. And why wouldn't they know their Bibles? They are in love with the Master and want to know Him more than anything else. For them, making disciples is done by an accurate presentation of the Word of God. Watching the Word do its work is an absolute joy. Okay, well, let's move on. I want you to think about this carefully. If the art of disciple making has been handed down from generation to generation faithfully, then the biblical plan of salvation should not have changed over 2,000 years. It is my conviction this pattern is exactly what we should still be teaching. Anyone who wants to become a Christian should be taught it will be their responsibility to obey and teach others the Great Commission. Now, if you're in a church which does not teach and practice this pattern, there's something missing. These four crisp commands of the Great Commission have been handed down generation after generation without alteration. It's never changed. Now, many churches laud the Great Commission, but very few put it into real practice and hold their members accountable for fulfilling it. The Great Commission is seen as a, a goal, a grand ideal, but not a requirement. Every person who calls themselves a Christian must be going, making, baptizing and teaching. There's no other kind of Christian. When you find a church which is actually holding its members accountable to biblical obedience, you'll find a growing healthy church. Evangelism, or making disciples, is not the pastor's or evangelist's job. Making disciples is the job of the church member. If we're not doing this at some level, we're in disobedience to the scriptures. Now, here's where this begins to get really personal. If a disciple is made, it would be reasonable to conclude that I should know the people who made me a disciple. In other words, who taught me the basic truths of the scriptures regarding salvation before I was saved. 
Remember, we're not talking about someone who gets us to come forward in the church service or pray a prayer. We're not talking about a person who guided you and counseled you after you believed in Jesus. We're talking about the person who sat down with you, opened the Bible, showed you the truth, and called you to the biblical standard of repentance and obedience before you were saved. So, let me ask you a question. Who made you a disciple? I can point back to a very specific point in time and place and person who reached out to me and showed me the truth by opening the scriptures. He helped me understand what sin is and its consequences. It took effort on his part. He showed me from the Bible what was involved in obeying Jesus. He called me to this Matthew 28, 18 commitment and made sure I understood I would be involved in the outreach activities of the church. I could not be a spectator. You see, a disciple makes another disciple by explaining and helping them obey the Great Commission. This has never changed. So again, who made you a disciple? Who taught you about the Great Commission before you were saved? The Great Commission is Jesus' plan to evangelize the world, and it is absolutely brilliant. A disciple makes a disciple. Can this be any clearer? You see, if we're not about the business of making disciples, are we truly disciples of Jesus? Well, this is the second command of the Great Commission, make disciples, and it carries quite a punch, doesn't it? Just like every other statement of the Great Commission, it is a command followed by a specific act of obedience and is not open to debate or negotiation. Every disciple of Jesus is involved in making disciples. It's not some sort of legalistic duty we perform in order to earn heavenly brownie points. Making disciples is the glorious and exciting response which springs from a faith that obeys. Well, thanks for listening and watching. Join the argument at www.faiththatobeys.org blog.